Hello everyone, I'm That Williams Guy here for another episode. We're actually recording this on Thursday, February the 2nd at 6.34 Eastern, and we have a treat today because this episode is going to be a little out of the norm, and this was something that uh, someone in our show group on Facebook asked, hey, hey, it would be great if you could interview one of Colonel Cooper's daughters, and Agent Freddie Bliss sprung into action and uh, has put us in contact with Lindy, one of Colonel yep. Cooper's three daughters. So Lindy, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Thank you. Would you take a moment and introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Uh, my name is Lindy Cooper Wisdom, and I'm the youngest of Jeff and Janelle Cooper's three daughters. And uh, that doesn't have any meaning anymore nowadays because we're all lo pretty long in the tooth. <laughs> but, um, and uh, I, uh, you know, lived at home until I went away to college and... Mm -hmm. I was part of the leather slap days. You know, I used to run balloons and, you know, uh, the Southwest Combat Pistol League, all that kind of stuff that was going on when I was growing up in Big Bear. You know, I'm, I'm fond memories and I'm happy to talk about it or answer any questions that anybody has. Oh, great. You know, just before we started the recording, you said something to the effect of, you know, growing up, he was dad. And we mm -hmm. all think, you know, this, that. Was there any concept or notion like at home, like this is dad and he's going to, he's not just dad, he's going to be remembered by the world as Colonel Cooper and the founder of this whole firearms training thing and, and like his place in history. Was there any knowledge of that or is, eh, it's just dad? There was no knowledge of that. No, not while we were growing up because he didn't, uh, he didn't start gun sight until I was grown and gone. Okay. And uh, Gunsight gave him the place to mm -hmm. teach. And of course he, he founded Gunsight because he was teaching, he was traveling and teaching all over the world and it was not very practical. <laughs> and it took up a lot of time and he thought, you know, there's enough interest in this, enough people want this that I, I need a place from which to do this. And that's when he and mom started looking for a place. And, and, and so, no, growing up there, mm -mm, he was dad. He used to substitute teach at my high school. So the, that was, uh oh, here's my dad and he's the teacher today. But <laughs> other than that, no, no. I mean, I, I just thought everybody's dad was like my dad. Yeah, that's interesting. I never knew that about him doing the substitute teaching thing. Um, yeah, you know, you know what else? He used to run lines at the football games. Okay. For exercise. All right. Um, what was it like growing up in, in the household with him? Uh, was, you know, did he teach you and, the, and your sisters about firearms and, and firearms? Were you, were you all taken out and have to learn all the stuff about the modern technique growing up? Uh, not exactly. He thought that we all should know how to shoot. Mm -hmm. So uh, when we, we, not particularly young, uh, you know, he didn't like start us at six or anything like that, but um, he thought it was a skill that we should know. And so he would take us out uh, and we would plink with the 22 at um, beer cans on fence posts uh when we were out on family picnics and things like that, but we did uh -huh. not do the modern technique. It was strictly plinking at, at, you know, just fun stuff. Nothing really emphasized about self-defense. Um, and, and the entire, uh, let's say curriculum that he developed that took time and that was being developed when, and when I was the last one home. So it was not something that he taught his three daughters. But when, when he had established gun sight and he had established the modern technique and he had established all of that training, um, everything that has to do with that kind of training, uh, I took the class, the the basic 250 uh -huh. class, but I was 28 years old at the time. 
Okay. And uh, it was hard, but but I I got an expert ticket out of it, and he didn't play favorites. I want to say that. <laughs> <sure>. <laughs> um, but did he teach you you and your sisters things about self-defense and awareness and mindset like if you were on a family trip somewhere did he point out things yes <laughs> yes and i i also i th- i think the most i don't know if is horribly unique but it's certainly I-, I came to understand later that it was unique for us amongst my circle and that was my dad was very uh adamant about the fact that at at the dinner table is where kids learn from their parents all the things they really need to know mm-hmm. you know everything important your your whole basis your whole moral compass is established there at the dinner table and so there were no interruptions at the dinner table and there was only one conversation at a time and so there was no you know, me and my sister chattering in the corner, there was one <laughs> person had the floor. And if I had the floor as the baby, I had the floor. I could say what I wanted and nobody interrupted me until, you know, I was done with what I had to say. So we were also taught, you know, how to converse, how to be good conversationalists and, and respect other people's uh, efforts to express themselves and which made me terrible in debate class later on in high school because I wouldn't interrupt anybody. Now, of course, well, I can't even watch debating on TV. It's just so, ooh, so irritating to me because there are no more manners. <laughs> yeah, my family was kind of cutthroat and like poking fun at each other and everything. And, and that has gotten me into trouble more times than I can imagine. <laughs> You know, going out because I'll I'll pop off at at, at uh, you know at times I probably shouldn't and say things that I oh. shouldn't because I could get away with it at the dinner table and uh, you know my father would allow you could say anything to him as long as you said it respectfully mm-hmm. and he loved if one of his children could outwit him oh yeah that's good he, 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 sure. you know or you know or, or bust him really good about something mm-hmm. and everything and uh, that that was. Uh, that was to be expected. And <laughs> I, I, I didn't realize that not everybody appreciates that and still don't realize that not everybody. Appreciates that. <laughs> I, I can see, I can see that. Yeah. Not everybody. <laughs> will. No, our table, our dinner table was very polite. You know, we, we had good manners. We were taught good manners and part mm-hmm. of it was mannerly con, uh, conversation. So mm-hmm. anyway, uh, oh, what were family trips like? Did, did he take you places? I know he was a historian. So did, so was, were family trips about history or were they just to, to go have fun at the park? No, no. Family trips were definitely opportunities to learn something about something. And uh, growing up in Big Bear, because Big Bear is a resort area, you know, up in the mountains and we have lakes and we have snow and we have um we're right there on the pretty much in the wilderness you know we did a whole lot of rock climbing and he would talk about I mean he was always teaching so he was always teaching us about what animals we were seeing what what trees we were looking at what kind of what this rock was made out of and and all that kind of stuff it was it was always very educational we took a few road trips in the car i remember one time we went uh down into mexico uh, my oldest sister was uh studying uh and staying with the family for the summer in guadalajara and i was 12 i remember this because i had a margarita and i went to sleep real fast <laughs> <laughs> Um, But I was 12 and and my sister Perry was in the car uh, with me. So she was 15. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wait a minute. 12, 13, 14. She had just turned 16 when we went on this trip and I was still 12. And uh, the four of us went down to Guadalajara, drove all the way down from uh, Big Bear Mm -hmm. to Guadalajara to visit my 
oldest sister. And then we went on down and down to Mexico City and we went uh, to the pyramids and yeah, all that kind of stuff was learning about who built the pyramids and what wars were fought there and, and uh, you know, who was in charge then and all about, he, he wrote his um, master's thesis on Cortez. And so he was real into that. And we learned a lot about that, the conquest of Mexico by the Spaniards when we were down there. So, yeah, it was it was like growing up with an encyclopedia um, at your fingertips and like a lot of lectures, but not in the not in a boring, terrible way, in a good way. You know, very educational. Uh Um. So when when you and your sisters were older and you're out on your own and all right, now dad's not here to protect you. Uh, you already mentioned that you went through the, the 250 class. Mm-hmm. Um, did he like pick out your personal defense firearm and say, here, here it is. Or did he give you the option of, of experimenting and picking out what you wanted? Well, he was, uh, I'm sure, as you know, he he had put a lot of research into mm-hmm. what is the best self defense gun, and and of course, meaning that you need enough power in that handgun to stop the aggression of the aggressor, mm-hmm. and so that had to do with shock effect, and and not not so much with what kind of injury or whether you were killing somebody, that was not it. It was all about the power and the shock effect so that whatever that person is, some person intent on coming at you was going to be stopped. So that was the 45. And uh, there wasn't really a lot of other discussion about that because through, through the research of everybody shooting all this, Mm -hmm. doing all these things, uh, for the with the Southwest Combat Pistol League and all these we had matches every month, you know, that's what was going to work. So uh, there wasn't really. I don't think I ever had a choice, and I also didn't didn't like it. It was too powerful, and uh, even when I took the class, uh, I mean, I, I don't, and I still I don't. Personally, I don't like having that explosion right there at the mm-hmm. end of my ha- at the end of my arm. I don't like that, mm-hmm. and I still don't. And I don't care what the what caliber it is, but I think that is is a reaction probably to basically just shooting a forty five all the time, a full a full size full load mm-hmm. forty five. But then, when I got interested in rifle shooting, I love shooting the rifles so for some reason there's something about having that a little further away and having the ability to make something happen way out there that that appeals to me so i I like to shoot rifles and i like to hunt okay well speaking of hunting did you go on hunting trips with him yes yes um it's funny because he he didn't really, he was a man of his era, of his time. He had daughters. He wasn't really uh, thinking of us as, as people who would do everything that he did. Mm-hmm. Like you might think, because you're a younger dad. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he was of an era where, you know, ladies did lady things. And, you know, the, almost, almost to the point where the men went in the drawing room to smoke cigars after dinner and the ladies went somewhere else not quite but so he he uh took me hunting one time early he and ray chapman and my mom and i went out camping and he and ray went off deer hunting and mom and i stayed in the camp and it really didn't occur to me because i again i didn't take the rifle class till i was in my 40s so it didn't occur to me then and didn't occur to mom that we should be doing that with them. You know, we stayed in camp and built the fire and, you know, gathered firewood and stuff like that. But 
he put together a hunting, a group of people to go hunting in Africa, uh, which was the first of, of many groups that he did. And all of a sudden, I was without a job because all this time I'm married, I, I'm working. I don't have time to go running around. I, you know, I got two weeks off and my husband and I go do other things. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, I, uh, my company got purchased and I was laid off and I was, didn't have a job. And he was putting together this group to go to Africa and he invited me. And I said, oh my goodness, sure. But I wasn't a rifle shooter and I didn't really know what I was doing. So, uh, that I, and I didn't go to hunt. I went as an observer. And uh, I was 44, something like that. And uh, so we went with this group. And uh, oh, it was, I just loved it. I loved ev everything about it, except I didn't like just watching. So I came back and I said, I got to take, take the rifle class from, who should I go to to take a rifle class from? Well, duh, you know, here's my dad. So... <laughs> I took his rifle class from him, and then I took uh, I, I went shooting once a month with John Ganaway, um, one of you know Dad's stalwart instructors, old friends, and he coached me once a month for a year until my dad put the next group together, and then I went to Africa the first time as a hunter, and I I've been to Africa ten times. I absolutely love hunting, but it doesn't have to be in Africa. You know, I, I don't care where it is. I really like being out in the boonies and paying attention to what the animals do, what their habits are, what the weather's like, you know, what's happening right now. If, with, if the acorns are out or not, all that stuff, just to get very much closer to nature than I normally am here living in the city and just breathing the air. And, you know, the fact that I might bring home some meat is a, is a bonus. All right. Uh, you, you mentioned your husband. And so, so I've got to ask, what was it like for you and your sisters bringing home boyfriends to meet dad? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, Again, see, because my dad is my dad, mm -hmm. I didn't think of it as being particular, you know, so you can come and meet my dad. But I will say that the young men that I brought home when I was in high school, for instance, were all a little bit intimidated and for various reasons. But one of the reasons was because, you know, he was a substitute teacher. Mm -hmm. and, but they also they knew things about him that I didn't even really realize so they were they were uh, extra respectful, I would say. Um, but you know, Dad wasn't he didn't do odd things like grill them or mm -hmm. you know, put them to any sort of tests or anything like that. <laughs> he did have comments to make about them after you know they'd gone home, <laughs> 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 which were pretty funny, but um. But no, he, he was, he, he was not, uh, you know, dictatorial. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always knew that he had certain expectations of somebody I would marry. And, but it, but it was never like, you will do this, or you won't do that, or you better not bring home an X or a Y. Mm -hmm. It was never anything like that. Mm -hmm. But because, uh, you know, growing up with a, a mom and dad that I really loved and I respected, it's sort of normal that I would gravitate towards someone who was like my dad. So I married a Marine. <laughs> did he appreciate that? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. And then my Marine became a cop. And he appreciated that too. Although dad was never a cop. Right. He certainly, certainly had uh, a lot of friends in law enforcement and was very pro law enforcement, if I would. So yeah, yeah I did fine. So you, you mentioned Ray Chapman and you mentioned John Ganaway. Uh, mm -hmm. What can you tell us about some of the personalities that came through? 
You mean of the of the old timers? Uh, yeah, uh, like okay. uh, like when he's when he, I know you were out of the house when you started gunsight, but obviously you were there visiting them and everything. So, yeah. Well, you you mean you? I know more about the the Big Bear people. Okay. Well, tell what about what about them? Okay. Well, you know you know that classic picture where all mm-hmm. five of them are pointing at the camera. Mm-hmm. Um. So. <laughs> um. They were all guests at our house basically once a month okay. and got to be very good friends with all of them. Um, the closest in age to me was Bruce Nelson, uh, who was only a couple years older than I am. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he, he wasn't one of the guys in that photograph. He was a, a later comer and he was a little mm-hmm. bit young because like when I was 16, he was 18. Mm-hmm. But the youngest of that group was, was um, Thel Reed. And Thel was uh a great guy i i i always liked it when he was i liked all of them they were all good guys um ray chapman and eldon carl are the two i knew the best because they came the most uh john plain i didn't know as well he didn't stay with us as often um but Jack Jack Weaver would bring his wife and his little kids, and uh, Jack was very soft spoken, uh, very self deprecating, and not uh, n- sort of your quintessential quiet cowboy. So he did not come across as as a real strong personality to me. Uh, the strongest personality of that group was was Eldon Carl. And Eldon was just charming and fun, super good dancer. You know, when when the the match was over and we would go back to my house, um, my mom norm would feed everybody and we'd put on put records on the record player and everybody would dance. And the, the best dancers were Ray and Eldon and my mom and my sister, Perry. They were the ones that did most of the dancing. <laughs> <laughs> but Eldon was a really good dancer. And part of that was he was just such a super well-coordinated human being. Mm-hmm. Just really, really good at, at anything that had anything to do with his physicality. And, of course, later on, he became um, very interested in motorcycles and did all his off-road motorcycling, you know, got got to be a, a very well-known figure in that sport. Um, he, he was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Ugh. Ray was uh, a little older than Eldon and, uh, you know, closer in age to my, to my dad. Uh-huh. He was... A little, uh, he was like halfway between Eldon and Jack Weaver. He was not as quiet as Jack and not as outgoing and fun loving as, as Eldon, but he was a lot of fun. As a bachelor, he owned a new Corvette. My memory is it was every year he bought himself a new Corvette and he would let me drive it into town. (laughs) <laughs> and Big Bear was a little town. I mean, we, I think um, full-time residence was something like 7,000 people. And for me to be able at, at 16, to be able to drive a brand new top-down Corvette through my two blocks of downtown <laughs> was so wonderful. And, and Ray would let me do that. And so, of course, always love him for that. <laughs> It, it was we we had one wonderful times with that all that whole everybody all the people who came to that it was good it was very very good aside from being very educational it was it was a lot of fun what was the interaction like between them did they sit around and pick each other's brains about different shooting techniques and the like or were they super secretive about the techniques because they were going to be competing with each other and just enjoy the social time. Oh, that's a very good question. Um, my dad was analyzing everything 
And I don't think everybody else was, mm -hmm. except John Plain, who was, uh, his background was in, um, uh, uh, what was it? It was like a physical therapist or something like that. His background was in human ergonomics. <laughs> and he, so he was kind of, was looking at everything like as a scientist and my dad was looking at it as as what worked but who's winning and why is he winning all the time and those guys that that was the top group and they were winning all the time and he, he was trying to figure that out if they all of them sat around talking about this subject you know who did what when and how it was I was, I never saw that. Okay. I don't think that happened. Right. It was more dad and, and John for sure were, were observing everything and paying attention to everything. I remember dad asking a couple of things, but I don't remember bull sessions with all those guys sitting around talking about where the finger goes or how to do this. I don't remember that. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the Corvette, which, by the way, that puts me getting to drive my great uncle's 74 Osmobile in the town to shame. Uh, uh -oh. that, 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 that doesn't, doesn't stand up to, to there anymore. Um, did your father have a favorite car? Oh, yeah. My dad uh, raced cars uh, mm -hmm. early on. And um, what happened was he was... Um, Working, a, he, they lived in Quantico when he was attached to the Marine Corps and he was, there was no place to park. And so he decided, to, and at that time, you know, the cars were all bigger. I think they had a Hudson. That was one of the cars they had. And so he got interested in getting a smaller car to find a parking place. And it turned out to be an MG. And then he got really interested in, wow, this is fun. And he started, uh, doing um rallies with my mom you know where, where you would get a, a destination and and she would be the navigator and they go off on these weekends and do these weekend jobs and stuff and he got more and more into that and then um he again he put his mind to it and started studying things and said oh you know the best car the one that's winning the uh road races because that that was that was the competition. I mean, how do you how do you pick a car? Well, you pick a car because of the, the ones that win at Le Mans and um, all, all of the road races because that's practical driving. It, they have courses where you have curves. You know, oval racing. He never that you know that's not real. That's like target shooting. Um, and he figured the Porsche. Porsche was the best made at the time and so he got himself a Porsche and every once in a while he let me drive that but the epitome was that he had a red 356 SC and that was what he had when I went away to college okay. and that was a mom. <laughs> I've heard a story about a BMW with a specific paint job oh Okay, I have heard that story and I can't verify that. Okay. Not know that. All right. Uh, dad uh, was, dad would, I would, I would say this. When we went on trips, he drove a little fast. Mm -hmm. He would ask us to keep our eyes out for the CHP. And so us girls were sitting in the back seat with our heads on swivels, trying to catch the uh, California mm -hmm. Highway Patrol before they caught him which worked most of the time <laughs> <laughs> for the, for the audience. If you're wondering what the story is, the, the story that was passed along to me was that he had a BMW that was painted with the same paint that a fighter jet was painted with so that it would uh, not absorb the radar uh, from the radar guns. Honestly, Lee, I don't think that's true. Okay. But it makes a good story. <laughs> And like, well, I mean, truthfully, I can't verify that it might right. it might have, happened, but that mm -hmm. doesn't sound like Deb. Yeah. But anyway, um, 
you mentioned your mother going out to hunting camp with him and, and her going on the rallies with them. Were they pretty much constant companions and, and her yes. partners and all of this? Yes. Yes. Mom did not go uh, on all of his overseas training jaunts uh, before he founded Gunsight. Cause he was going to a lot of hot spots mm-hmm. and um, she did not go with him on all. And besides that, you know, the, the two younger girls were still home. Mm-hmm. Um, now later after he, after he, he uh, helped start Ipsic, they went together to everything. So they went all over the world with the uh, international practical shooting confederation and uh, met you know, their humongous circle of international friends. Uh-huh. And that was wonderful. But yeah, constant companions, you bet. Uh, I have a request here from someone wanting her brownie recipe. Oh, ha! okay. I am going to put that on my website. Uh, okay. After my dad died, we we put together the Jeff Cooper Legacy Foundation. Mm-hmm. And the Jeff Cooper Legacy Foundation has a website and um, I do not do a very good job of keeping it uh, all fun and interesting and, and interactive and brand new all the time. But I am going to put mom's brownie recipe on the website as soon as I get around to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's funny how recipes and like that become so so much part of like a family's lore. Mm-hmm. You know, my grandmother on my mother's side made the world's best cornbread. And, mm-hmm. and, and one of my regrets in life is that I didn't spend five minutes in the kitchen with her learning how to make it. And I've got her skillet. It sits right here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got it. That's a probably a hundred and something year old cast iron skillet from the Birmingham Stove and Range Foundry. Uh, she mm-hmm. grew up just outside of Birmingham. Mm-hmm. Um, but she made the world's best cornbread. And, yeah, you know, she would always bring me some. Every time she came out to see us, she brought cornbread. If I went to town, she made, you know, it was always one batch made just for me. And, you know, she's gone now. And mm-hmm. then it was like one of the things that I just, uh, I, and I have tried and tried and tried to recreate it. Oh. And, and I can, I would always, I would get close with the taste. Mm-hmm. I never, never could get the texture quite right. And then, you know, one day, uh, chance thing, I get a friend request from someone that I knew vaguely back home. And she had grown up on the same street that my grandmother lived. This grandmother lived in town. The other grandmother lived on oh. the farm where, I, where I grew up. And this girl had lived on the same street with her and she learned how to make my grandmother's cornbread and gave me the recipe. Oh, you lucky dog. And I came home and I made it every night for <laughs> several weeks until finally I made myself sick eating that cornbread. I ate so much of it. And it's like, okay, we've got to, we've got to get some, some, some uh, order of balance here. And so I backed off on it. Some of it. <laughs> but uh, uh, the secret was, uh, and why the texture was never right was that she would heat Crisco in the skillet in the oven. And so that nothing it was loose, loose Crisco, you know, hot Crisco in the skillet. And she would pull it out and she would pour the hot Crisco in the batter mm. and start stirring it really quickly. So it's frying the batter before she poured it back into the skillet. And she would leave just enough in there so that it would form a hard crust when it hit the hot oil that was still left in there. And so you had the whole time it was baking in the oven, there was enough Crisco mixed in into the dough or excuse me, the batter that is, it's also frying on the inside. And that's why I never got the texture right. Of course. Yeah. You know that there are little tricks Mm -hmm. often. There's just little touches and that's the difference and you can taste it. Right. And I never would. Go ahead. I have tweaked my mom's original brownie Mm -hmm. recipe. And so um, when I post it, I I will, I will make mention of, you know, what, what I've done to tweak it to, to, I think it's an improvement. It's just more (laughs) something that I like, you know, but it it wasn't, but I have to admit that I'm going to put mom's original recipe and then I'm going to put my little tweaks because 
I put a little coffee, a little espresso powder in the mix Mm -hmm. because I like that. Mom never did that, that kind Mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, You mentioned the foundation. Uh, One of the the show audience wanted to know what could people do to help the foundation? Send money. (laughs) (laughs) We we are a 501c3, mm-hmm. um, so deductions, I mean, uh, any donation is tax deductible. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can go on the website and there is a donate here or you just click right there and you, yeah. And every, we have been able to function um, since we put this together, which 2006, without any administrative costs except printing our brochures Mm -hmm. because we have such wonderful friends uh and who who help us get what needs to be done done plus family members who Mm -hmm. who donate their time and expertise and whatever it is we're dealing with to to help us keep going and also because we have we have wonderfully wonderfully supportive friends financially, our biggest supporter to date is John Ganway. Uh, John passed in September. Mm. Uh, he continues to be our biggest uh, supporter even after he's gone, and uh, we will always be grateful to him for all, many things, especially for that. Mm. But we maintain all of dad's collections so that people can see it and view it when they come to Gunsight. And Buzz and Sonia, who own Gunsight, are uh, our, our landlords and are, are absolutely wonderfully gracious, allowing us to stay in my mom and dad's house and display everything. Mm-hmm. And then we also we raise money in order to give scholarships for the 250 class at Gunsight to people who apply. So you can also apply for a scholarship online and um, there isn't any magic uh, in, in obtaining a scholarship, but we are um, partial, I would say, to people who put themselves in harm's way for others. Okay. We're, we got soft spot for people like that. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. So <laughs> um, you mentioned the house there. We've all heard of the sconce. How did, how did your father get the idea for the sconce? Um, my dad had been traveling when he was writing for guns and ammo. Uh, he gained a reputation through that writing his articles and his uh question and answer column and that's when he started people started asking him to come and help them with their problems uh people in south africa people in guatemala people in the philippines um who were who were threatened more so than we you know know in this country and wanted to learn better how to defend themselves. So dad was doing a lot of traveling and he was doing a lot of um, observing and learning like he always did anywhere he went. And home invasion was a threat, uh, in, especially in Latin America. Um, in, in many countries in Latin America, there, was a, uh, there were uh, the bad guys, whoever they were, whoever they would uh, were affiliated with w- needed always to finance themselves. And so one of the things they liked to do was to kidnap wealthy people, uh, farmers or landowners or businessmen and hold them for ransom to raise money for their, you know, anti whatever activities, anti government or anti whatever they were fighting against. It was different from place to place. Mm -hmm. So home invasion and kidnapping was serious. And so dad uh, put his mind to that and said, oh, you know, it'd be interesting. It would be interesting, wouldn't it, to design a house that had that in mind instead of just picking uh, 
you know, at random, some house design that you like. So he sat down and he put his mind to it and he came up with, you know, this, that, and whatever sort of idea, this would be good and that would be good, et cetera. And uh, he talked about it a lot. And uh, my husband and I were up there working for him uh, for one year. It, we, last, <laughs> we lasted one year. But uh, during that time, he kept talking about it. And finally, I said to him, and they were living in a trailer in a double wide mobile home. But they had the land there where they built the sconce. And so he had, just, he had the, all these ideas about how to use that lip that was sort of a lip that stuck out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I said, Dad, you keep talking about this. Put your money where your mouth is and sit down and put this together. And he, he didn't do it. And finally, I uh, lost patience. And I said, OK, Dad, we are going to do this. So I sat down with him and I and I wrote out everything he, we talked about. I drew all the plans. I mean, they aren't plan plans. They're just like stick figure plans. But I drew it all out and I said, OK, so now you what do you want here? How does this go? Let's go here. How does this work? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, that finally got him going. And he finally went and hired a, a contractor to put this house together. And so that's how that happened. And it came together. It's very, it's, and it's very interesting. And we, we give, when we, mm -hmm. every graduating 250 at uh, Gunsight gets invited over to the sconce for a tour and brownies and Arnold Palmer's. And um, we talk about what those features are and where you, where you can see them. And, and I know that Ken Campbell just built his house up there and he incorporated uh, several, but at least one of those features in his new house, because right. they're, you know, they're good features. It's just like the modern technique, you know, mm -hmm. do you use it or not? Well, you incorporate what works and if it works, then it's good. So yep. it was a lot of fun. Okay. Yeah. Um, what can you tell us about his writing process? Um, not, not much. Okay. Uh, I know that he generally didn't write a lot of drafts. He thought about it and then he sat down and he put it down. He didn't need a lot of editing. Mom was his editor. Uh, you know, he and mom are both Stanford graduates and both very smart and very well read and I, I doubt he ever needed much editing from any editor. Uh, you'd have to ask Tom Seattle's about that at Guns and Ammo. But he, uh, again, he he came up with an idea. He thought about it, and then whoosh, there it was. Mm -hmm. That that's my understanding. Okay. What's the most important thing your father ever taught you? Oh, um, his philosophy of life was that is it is incumbent upon you as a human being three things to understand the problem number two to appreciate and to pull your weight and of course he explained all of those things, but mm -hmm. uh, that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite memory of him? Oh, well, it, it, many, but mm -hmm. the first time I went hunting in Africa and we are standing together, I'm, I'm aiming at a springbok and he's standing right there at my shoulder and the one I'm looking at is not the one he's looking at so he said he he he, he didn't bug me but he did say too late and I said no it's not bang and mine fell down the one he was looking at <laughs> when it got away that was 
that was fun. Like you said, it was sort of like, sort of like um, being smart to your dad, you know, mm -hmm. in a yeah. good way. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite memory of your mother? Oh, golly, mom. Uh, one of my most favorite memories is uh, we, she and I and my two sisters took a trip to Bermuda. Um, just us girls mm -hmm. when she was 80. And we took a little day trip out on a boat. And she had never snorkeled before. And so I said, you got a snorkel. Here we are. And so I, I taught her how to snorkel and I was just, it was just neat. And she's 80 years old and we're standing there and I said, okay, you know, put your, we're standing there about chest deep in the water, you know, put your face down, make sure, you know, you're breathing mm -hmm. and then let your feet raise up and we held hands and went snorkel. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um was was he able to know grandchildren i'm not sure oh, yeah. what the timing of everything would be absolutely and great grandchildren okay yeah um yeah he he and mom had five grandkids and uh all of them are married all of them have kids mm -hmm. and the oldest of those is 19 um, i think and so yes he, he was able to know and in fact, their oldest grandchild, great grandchild, is named after my mom. Her name is Jane Ellen, and my mom's name was, even though everybody called her Janelle, it was mm -hmm. Jane Ellen. Okay. So, uh -huh. um, what other stories about them would you like to share? Oh, well. Mom and dad used to, uh, of course, it was a sign of the times, but when they were dating, you know, they dated in high school okay. and then they dated in college and married when she was a senior at Stanford and he was in basic school or had just gotten out of basic school. Mm -hmm. And February 6th is their anniversary. And they eloped. And almost got stuck uh, in a snowstorm and almost per I mean, could easily have perished that night and never gotten married. And that would, we wouldn't be sitting here talking about this. <laughs> but um, I, one of the, the only time that I remember my dad um, disciplining me severely was when I talked back to mom. And the way they parented was it's okay with me, but go check with your dad. Mm -hmm. It's okay with me, but go check with your mom. Mm -hmm. And if either one said no, if, if either one said no, the answer was no. And there was no talking about it. So they had a united front always. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that gives a kid such a good sense of security. You know, it's either it's either yes or it's no. And if it's no, you don't go whining and you don't go complaining to anybody. It's just no. <laughs> so just really they, they they were a really good couple. <clears throat> I, I am flashing back to the worst whipping I got as a child. Oh, oh I, I'm, I'm, I'm like seriously going back in time right here and remembering that one vividly that I asked asked daddy if I could do something and he said no so I went and asked mom if I could do it and she said yes not knowing that daddy had told me no mm -hmm. and I went and did it because mama said it was okay and uh, he found out <laughs> <laughs> surprise <laughs> <laughs> yeah that 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 one was bad that that one was uh I, I never made that that uh, error in judgment again yeah 
Well, yeah, I, I smart mouth to my mom and that was the one and only time I ever did that because <laughs> dad heard it and man, uh, okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I, I, they were, they were great. Yes. Yeah, smart mouthing either one of them would not have been tolerated at, at our house either. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but dad, my father loved, um, it was still, you know, if you could outdo him, mm -hmm. like if you could, if you could get him with something or whatever, and um, uh, my parents eloped as well, and uh, my father was twenty one and my mother was fifteen when they eloped. Oh my gosh! And he moved her into his parents' house. Oh, well, they, they eloped and came back to his parents' house, <laughs> and uh, he he got to. Uh, got to poking at me one day about I hadn't left home immediately after graduating high school and everything my daddy did a much better job of raising me than I did of raising you and everything I said oh, oh, oh really <laughs> I, I haven't brought a wife home yet <laughs> I haven't brought an extra mouth to feed yeah I haven't <laughs> brought a wife home yet and the rest of that story was is that uh when when they did move out, they put a single wide next to my grandparents and hooked it into my grandparents' power. <laughs> and my grandmother had told me all of this. And oh. so, um, and, and, so no, and said, oh, by the way, uh, I haven't moved. I haven't moved my wife next door and hooked to your power yet <laughs> either. And he he appreciated it. But at the same time, and finally he said, that, that was between me and my father. I said, yep. And this is between me and mine. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. never raised the subject again. It was like he knew he'd been whipped on that one. And yep. uh, th that was it. Yep. Um, and and he's fair about it. Oh, yeah. Huh? This is, oh, this yeah. Is, okay, you got me. Uh, he, he, he said one day that he was going to line us all up and give us a good whipping for everyone, everything that he missed as we were growing up. And I said, okay, all right. When you get done, I'm going next door to get grandma. <laughs> I want to bring her down here for you to get yours. Oh, <laughs> he's like he rethought that plan uh, pretty quickly. <laughs> what goes around comes around, doesn't it? Oh yeah, that that was the kind of stuff that 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 uh, that went on with us, and it's still you know <laughs> if we can mess with each other, we enjoy enjoy that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. uh, is there anything that you would like to tell us about your 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 parents that I have not asked about? I can't think of anything, Lee. Um, you've asked good questions. I had to think about this. Um, I just consider myself su super lucky. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I said in the beginning, your, your dad is your dad. You know, your mom is your mom. You kind of figure, I mean... As a kid, you're pretty selfish. You're pretty self-absorbed. You're not really pay paying a lot of attention to what your friends, what mm -hmm. their home lives are like, right. what their parents are like. Um, but you know, the the more the more I matured and the more I understood what other how other people had been raised and what mm -hmm. circumstances other people have had to deal with in in their upbringings, I just am just the luckiest person ever to have had, you know, my parents, uh, together and, uh, for a long time. I mean, my mom lived to be 99. Mm -hmm. And so how lucky is that? Wow. So I, I don't, I, I'm sorry that not everybody could have the upbringing I did. Cause well, it was great. Uh, you mentioned the foundation. If you could tell our audience how they can go about finding it, what's the web address, et cetera? Uh, it's www.jeffcooperfoundation.org. Okay. And uh, we, uh, we are a 501c3. Um, on there, like I said, I, I could do a much better job of keeping it up to date. <laughs> um, there are lots and lots of family photos on there. And uh, some, in, you know, obviously a way to donate. And uh, I try to do updates from time to time about our scholarship program and how many people we put through. Um, oh, I would like to say one thing. Three, 
of our scholarship recipients have become gun site instructors. Wow. I know. That's a wow. It's mm -hmm. very impressive. It's not that easy. Uh, and that's, you know, where it started for them. And we are really proud of that. And I got the bright idea. I, I need to emphasize that. Write up these people and get it on the website. And I haven't done it <laughs> yet. I think the brownie recipe is going to go first. <laughs> But well, I think that's that's marvelous that that we have been able to we we've reached over a hundred people with our scholarships and all kinds of people, you know, young, old, men, women. There's youth scholarships. We it's it's all for the introductory class though because we haven't expanded enough to to do more, but we may. Okay. Well, thank you for, for coming on tonight and sharing so many wonderful things about your, your family. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. And uh, it, it means a lot that you that you came came on. And, and for me and for the audience and for everyone that is interested in this topic, uh, please allow me to thank your father for that, for everything that he did for us. Mm, thank you. Yeah. And uh, with that, to the audience, we know that your most important asset is your time. Thank you for choosing to spend some of it with us. Hello, everyone. I'm That Williams Guy here for another episode. We're actually recording this on Thursday, February the 2nd at 6.34 Eastern. And we have a treat today because this episode is going to be a little out of the norm. And this was something that... Uh, Someone in our show group on Facebook asked, hey, hey, it would be great if you could interview one of Colonel Cooper's daughters. And Agent Freddie Blish sprung into action and uh, has put us in contact with Lindy, one of Colonel yep. Cooper's three daughters. So, Lindy, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Thank you. Would you take a moment and introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Uh, my name is Lindy Cooper Wisdom, and I'm the youngest of Jeff and Janelle Cooper's three daughters. And uh, 